Stanford University. I am in the uh, chemical engineering department and the radiology department uh, here at Stanford. And I was at the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for 25 years. And I actually uh, cut my teeth in the uh, green chemistry material science uh, interface and uh, ended up starting a, uh, was there for 25 years and ended up starting a 3D printing company that we moved from Chapel Hill to uh, Redwood City and uh, grew it there and, and did that for six years and then got my life back and uh, friends here at Stanford came calling and ended up staying uh, on the West Coast uh, because of the great science and five granddaughters who all are here. So that was a, a good move. And um, so, you know, I think a lot of us think a lot about, talk, often talk about what we do. And a uh, few of us get an opportunity to share why we do what we do. <laughs> and for me, growing up, and being in college in the 1980s and 1990s, um, ended up thinking a lot about uh, why we do what we do. And for me, you know, Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring, really drove a lot of the global environmental movement. And you know, later in my career, uh, I ended up doing a lot in the area of lithography. And work, my PhD was in the area of uh, uh, E-beam resist and working in the microelectronics world. And this paper in particular was really influential uh, for me to see this paper. And they talk about a, a 1.7 kilogram microchip. And the, the point was it's, <clears throat> you know, everyone's squinting. What does that mean? But it's, it's basically all the reagents and chemicals required to make a microchip. And all the resources that go into, this is not even the energy issues, but all the chemical issues that go into fabrication. There's a lot of waste in this, in this industry. And when you think about also not only that waste, but the energy consumption, and now with AI and, and just the boom that's happening required in that field and how much energy is required. And a lot of this is the interplay between you know, materials and, uh, and society. And that's a lot about what we're, we're talking about here. And when you think about you know, materials in a, in a circular economy, a number of key elements, I think, as I reflected on this symposium, I reflect on our speakers, um, a lot of opportunities to think through um, issues related to sourcing and extraction methods. And in fact, this drove a lot of my own interest uh, in this space. Um, other issues rely heavily uh, are driven by the design principles of not only fabricating something for its function, but also thinking about its, and its durability, but also its recyclability. Thinking about closed loop process, processes, closed loop products, and the opportunities for that kind of circular mentality and that circular thinking. So design for performance, function, manufacturability, and the life and recycling is, is really critical. And what are those advanced recycling technologies? And, and some of them are easier to think about when they're integrated on the front end of fabrication. You know, we are all staring at the mega plastics issue uh, in society. And there was no foresight or forethought regarding recyclability. This is just extraction of oil and putting it out there. And now we're, you know, we're all thinking a lot about these microplastics. And you know how many t tires we go through, car tires and truck tires we go through a society. Where is all that material? We don't see it. There should be piles of stuff on the side of our roads. Because all the you know, those tires are getting worn out, but we don't see it. It's somewhere. And these issues are really paramount. And so thinking about what are the advanced recycling strategies and technologies that are needed for, especially for legacy products that there wasn't the foresight to think about a closed loop product going forward. And then, you know, I think, and this is the one I think really strikes me the most, are the business models uh, and policies related, related to that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty insane to think about that, you know, you could probably snap the chalk line today and say, in many areas, and say, no more research. We have enough solutions out there 
but these are policy issues now and the, and the, and the implementation issues. Uh, that's not all fields. There's still a lot of research needs here, but there's a lot of things that you could say, there's solutions there, but they're not happening because of the way we do curbside pickup, uh, the fact that we don't, we don't have closed loop products out there. So, you know, I think the coolest thing about being at Stanford is the comprehensive nature of this university. Uh, we think about just hardcore science and engineering, but the policy aspects are front and center too, and the government implications. And so this, this is the whole university coming together, and that's what's beautiful about why we're here today. And I hope many of you have a diverse set of backgrounds because these are just not technical solutions needed. Uh, we, need, we need broader implementation. So that's a little bit of framework as I was thinking about the symposium and our wonderful speakers uh, here today. Um, as I alluded to, so I'm old, and I've been at this for a while. And um, this was our, one of our biggest papers that helped launch my career, uh, was a paper that demonstrated the ability of making uh, really important, technologically important materials, classes of Teflon, uh, in ways that avoided something we hear about today, PFAS and the persistent organic pollutants that were associated with this process. So um, this pa our paper showed up in science, and we said we could avoid these other reagents. We could use supercritical CO2 as a solvent to replace water and surfactants or organic solvents, in this case perfluorocarbons or chlorofluorocarbons. And, um, and it, was a, it, was, it was a really a fun thing to work on in the early 90s. The PFAS issue has been the slowest train wreck I have ever seen happen, and it's still unfolding. And you can point to some early examples of this could have been figured out early on. In fact, it, there were solutions there, but there were policy issues that didn't implement this. In particular, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill licensed this technology to the DuPont Company exclusively. Now, when I say the DuPont Company, you shouldn't think of a monolithic organization. There were, there were, we had fans at DuPont that loved this, and then we had business units that were like, hey, I got a plant running in the ground that's making profit, and that pays my salary and my bonuses. And there were competing interests, there were entrenched interests. In fact, this is why I became an entrepreneur, because if we had this today and we weren't hooked on to DuPont, we would have done it ourselves. And so those of you that you know, are donors to the university and business people, these are the things we get to do with the mission of what we're doing in society, is to be able to drive new, new ideas, think of a new future, and move these forward. We, got, we messed this up because of licensing agreements. And if I had this invention today, we would have competed with them, and I, hopefully we would have won. But these are the kinds of things that, that come to life. In addition, and I don't want to cry on this one, but we, had, we used a cousin to that process to use liquid carbon dioxide to replace perchloroethylene in dry cleaning. And perchloroethylene is a, is a known human carcinogen. It's the most common way that people bring in carcinogens into the home, uh, wrapped in plastic that dry cleaners still use heavily today. This was a liquid CO2 using beverage grade CO2, nature's effervescence, uh, to do dry cleaning. We launched a business in this space. And we, built, we had 70 dry cleaners open around the country, and, and this was my first foray into business. And, and uh, it was a lot of fun while we did it. Um, but a really important tenet we learned, um, well, one is you know, being er too early is like being wrong. That's a business tenet. Another one is people don't pay for environmental uh, impact. And dry cleaning is an industry, it was a $20 billion industry and very low margins. And to introduce a space age technology into an industry that's got a negative kegger. Back then, I didn't know what a kegger was. I thought a kegger was a party. Uh, but a, you know, a negative compound annual growth rate is not a good industry to introduce you know, advanced environmental technologies. People don't pay for it. So a lot of lessons learned in policies and business to bring these kinds of things forward. So fast forward with all that experience and all those scars, you know, we launched a new business in the area of advances in 3D printing. And uh, it was a breakthrough in how one manufactures things with light, close cousin to how microelectronics are processed using light. Uh, but this is light in three dimensions, not just two dimensions. 
And um, I won't go into the details, but uh, this is a process that <clears throat> allowed us to rapidly improve the speed with which one, with one does 3D printing. And it became, I think, the bridge from 3D printing from prototyping to manufacturing. When you're just on prototyping, environmental impacts are minimal. When you get into manufacturing, this is where the opportunities are. And so we're using pattern light uh, through a very special reservoir window at the bottom of this. It's not only optically transparent, but it's permeable to oxygen. There is a physical gap between the part and the window. It allows the process to go 100 to 1,000 times faster. And um, we built an amazing business at the intersection of hardware, materials, and software. And I think of this as a software-controlled chemical reaction to grow parts. Uh, we launched this business. We found it in Chapel Hill, moved it to Redwood City. A uh, company's called Carbon. This is what some of our customers' factories look like. But it's making things with light uh, instead of injection molding and heat and pressure to, to cram resin into a mold. And it dramatically speeds the, the innovation process because you're designing products on the means of production. So you can design something on Monday morning and test it on Tuesday out of the same tool that you'll scale it up in out of the same resins that you, it's a final product. And there's lots of examples of where this is happening. It's heavily happening in oral, uh, oral health dentistry. The industry that Invisalign created, uh, their patents um, expired a number of years ago and now they have less than 50% market share and we power the other, the rest of that. We have the world's first FDA approved 3D printed dentures. Uh, handcrafted materials that are now done digitally. About half a million people doing dentures this way. Um, and then in the elastomer area, we have Adidas running shoes and football helmets. Most of the NFL players are wearing bespoke helmets this way, CCM hockey, uh, many other bicycle saddles. And now moving into the largest uh, TAM, and that's the injection molding marketplace. So advanced materials, advanced resins, advanced software. Uh, this is a massive market. Um, and all made with light, all with uh, the tenets of things related to waste reduction. Again, back to the concept of on the front end thinking about where you're going. Bio-based feedstocks, uh, designed for manufacturability, designed for recycling. And then you get into some business level things related to a warehouse in the cloud. You know, the idea that right now Society has billions and billions of dollars tied up in inventory, often in climate-controlled warehouses, waiting to be used for years. And actually, those parts age, and they have to be flipped out. But they need them to guarantee business. And you think about the supply chain logistics, shipping a product overseas, where you could have local for local production and make them here. So this is, I think these are examples of technology, business policies, overarching policies of how to move things together. And again, these are the kinds of tenets that you know, we're trying to promulgate uh, here at Stanford. And the last thing that my team's working on is advanced materials that not only go beyond polymers, but now incorporate advanced 3D printing, advanced high resolution 3D printing, and a technology rel related to pyrolysis. So we can now take organic polymers and convert them to elemental carbon that are conductive, uh, and also advanced ceramics like silicon carbide, silicon nitride, and beginning to power new kinds of things related to energy storage, new kinds of battery electrodes, new kinds of ways of heating with Jonathan Fan here on campus. Jonathan's got a beautiful program. You know, I think 30% of the CO2 in the United States is emitted from the chemical industry by burning fossil fuels to drive endothermic reactions. People want to electrify the chemical industry like they electrify the transportation industry. The most energy efficient way to electrically heat something is inductive heating. Jonathan's got a beautiful program to integrate reactor design and heating, and we're designing new generations of susceptors uh, using 3D printing and helping power that. So these are just some examples of the kinds of things that, uh, that we're driving forward. So with that, let me transition to uh, uh, the next generation of folks. Uh, we have an amazing group of faculty here uh, at Stanford doing a lot of different things. There's a lot of things we could have chosen uh, to uh, emulate some of these kinds of ideas going forward, and you'll see some amazing uh, projects at different, very different perspectives, different departments across campus. Uh, I won't go through uh, introducing their details, so I'll go through that for you, but 
Thank you for joining us here. And with that, let me chain, chain over to Dan to start. Thank you. It's my distinct honor to be up here uh, sharing the stage with such wonderful scientists and excited to hear more about their innovations as we go, as well as I'm really excited to be able to uh, chat with people doing such cool and interesting work, not only in the academic space, but of course in the industrial space as well, really thinking about how all of these factors can combine uh, to really drive uh, societal change. And I'm really excited to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in our lab, really focused on how we can drive the scalability and the sustainability uh, of additive manufacturing. And I think those two words, scalability and sustainability, are of real relevance to this crowd here. So my lab thinks a lot about light, about light in different contexts. And I'll do a short plug at the end of all the different ways we think about it. But when we think about it in terms of using light to drive a process, if you look across different fields, you often find that there's a surprisingly similar challenge lurking in all of them. Namely, that if you're trying to use light to drive a process, it's often hard to get that light to where it needs to be. It can be scattered, it can be absorbed before it gets to the location that you're targeting. And the canonical example of this is, is tissue, right? Many people, including here at Stanford in biology and bioengineering departments, have figured out really amazing things you can do inside tissue, yet getting light there, getting those high energy photons there is often a very large challenge, right? And, and you have to come up with all sorts of complicated techniques to get the light deep within tissue. It doesn't penetrate uh, very well on its own. And of course, here I want to talk about a slightly different application space, and that is additive manufacturing. Now, if we take a minute and we just kind of all block out Joe's introductory talk for just a second, I would argue uh, that a very natural way to do uh, 3D printing is to take an entire material volume and cure it uh, all at once, picking out your spots in X, Y, Z, uh, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. You cure it, and you just have your part whole formed in that that. That would be really interesting. Think about something like the Star Trek replicator, for example. But this, again, this problem rears its ugly head, right? How do you get that light to where it needs to be? If you, for example, take a laser beam and just focus it down to that spot, what you find is, sure, you can get this little spot. I'm not going to use my laser pointer on a TV that's asking for trouble. You can get that little spot there cured in the middle, but you're also going to cure all the way on the way in and all the way on the way out. And you don't have that selectivity that you need to really drive the shapes that you want to print and enable arbitrary prints. And so this challenge has really driven lots of folks, and Joe has made tremendous progress uh, in doing this and, and bringing this to industry, uh, using these stereolithography methods where you basically are constantly creating a fresh surface and printing from there. But I would argue if we want to move back to that three-dimensional picture, there's a way that we can do this. And this is if we can take advantage of a process called upconversion. And now this is a process that my lab has thought about a lot. Uh, and basically it's the idea of taking two lower energy photons and somehow finding a way to jam their energy together to create one higher energy photon. Uh, and this is a really exciting process because if you think about adding this in to this same example we were talking about previously, now we can use a low energy beam that perhaps passes that challenge that can make it through that absorption or that scattering event without a challenge and locally generate our high efficiency light where we want it. So we can turn this really big non-selective laser beam into just a point of light. And you can imagine in the context of 3D printing, if you could somehow couple this spot here to a photo initiator to polymerization, you could really drive uh, towards this whole volumetric printing ideal. And so we are far from the first people to stand up and say, hey, let's take a, a quadratic process with this upconversion technique and apply it to, to additive manufacturing. I want to highlight there's basically an entire field out there utilizing a process called two-photon absorption, which very different from a physical perspective, but actually if you look at it at a high level, it's quite similar uh, to, localize, to localize light to what we're doing. Uh, and there's several companies out of there. I highlight this one out of Germany called Nanoscribe, where they use this, this quadratic process or this upconversion process to do these nanoscale 3D prints. And I took these straight from their website because I think they're absolutely beautiful, right? As an engineer, I look at these and these are just gorgeous, right? This process allows you to get really true three-dimensional printing. You can build these arbitrary, complicated structures with nano, uh, nanoscale resolution. And there's a whole bunch of applications that you could imagine you could address with these. But this also comes with really big 
challenges. Namely, this process requires very high power densities, and so you buy a really expensive six-figure laser, you jam all that energy into a really small spot, uh, and that means that it takes a long time to print, because you have to go spot, 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 spot. And as an example of this, we have some colleagues here at Stanford which use this technique to print these amazing micro-needle arrays, which again, I think are, are quite beautiful, but what they found is that printing a couple square millimeters here took over 12 hours of time in the processing window. And so you can imagine if you wanted to scale that up even a little bit more to do even larger areas or, or other applications, you're really talking about days and days of fabrication time, and that really becomes untenable. So we wanted to see if we could use a different upconversion process to really drive this forward. Now, given just the limitations of the time, I'm actually not gonna go too much into the details of the upconversion process we use. Suffice it to say, uh, we figured out a series of molecules that if you mix them in sort of the perfect pixie dust ratio and add them, you can really drive this forward. And so you can go into the lab, you can bake a bunch of chemicals, you spend a lot of time figuring it out, and eventually it works, and we can build ourselves uh, a 3D printing setup here. This is our, our very first printer that we used uh, to try this process out. We actually uh, have a red laser beam here, and it comes all the way on this fiber into this transition head. This is actually a FDM, an extrusion 3D printer that we ripped the print head off. Uh, it still gets angry at us that there's no resin every, or uh, no filament every single time we try to print, uh, but that's okay. We use it to move light around instead. And importantly here for this first uh, example that we're showing, we used less than four milliwatts of CW laser power, meaning that relative to that six-figure laser of, of a nanoscribe printer, there's actually more power in this laser pointer here than we were using to do our 3D printing. So it really can highlight the power, uh, the power opportunities there. And so we can try to print uh, this boat here. This is a benchmark print because it's typically pretty hard to print, and we can we can. We can do this, right? This video is sped up. This takes about two hours of print time. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, but at the focal point of this objective here, there's a little dot of blue light. You can't actually see it because it's absorbed by the resin. That light then couples to a photo initiator, uh, which causes the resin to harden. And then we move to the next point and the next point and the next point. And eventually it finishes up. I haven't timed it very well. Uh, and you can look in the vial and immediately you see your, your three-dimensional shape there. Uh, which is pretty cool. You can actually fish this out, wash it off, uh, and you get pretty nice boats. Now, these boats aren't perfect, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, but we are uh, very proud of them. But ultimately, when we think about manufacturing opportunities and looking at the scalability opportunities, there's a lot of really good ways, and again, Joe has pioneered a bunch of them, to make things that are sort of at this, at this large scale uh, sample, and so we really wanted to push this and drive towards those opportunities to build nanoscale structures, right, to improve the resolution of the system. And so we went ahead and did this. We redesigned our resin to work now to get a resolution in, or a, a, a feature size instead of being about 100 microns down to the nanometer scale, and we figured out how to excite these materials uh, parallel so that that, that two-hour print time be can become much smaller. Uh, and so here's the setup that we build. Basically, we can use uh, a digital micromere device here. This is in a lot of sort of Pico projectors. They're just tiny little microscale mirrors that flip and create an image. We can couple that into our 3D printing resin, uh, and here's an image of that particular printer there. And this allows us now to print, instead of doing one spot at a time, we can do up to two million spots at a time. And so this gives us a really drastic speed increase here. Of course, the challenge if you want to move to the nanoscale is that you actually have to be at the nanoscale, right? Uh, you have to prove that you can print there. So we can do that in this initial work here. And what we can find, actually it's really hard to see, but there's just one single line of pixels on here on this screen. Uh, and we can just shine that in between two support structures and, and use electron microscopy to measure how big it gets. Um, and what we find is that we can indeed achieve a couple hundred nanometers of resolution uh, in all three, all three dimensions. And actually we have, uh, I can't talk about it too much publicly, but we have eyes down to hopefully getting eventually below 100 nanometers using similar techniques, uh, which should be quite a lot of fun. But importantly here, the reason we're all doing this is because we want to really drive the scalability. We want to make the opportunity to make these things larger. And so by engineering our systems design and our resin, eventually we're able to get to the, the proof of concept here. Now this is a real-time printing video. So this is taken in our microscope as we're printing over less than about four seconds or so. It's the same boat I showed you previously, but now we're looking at a top-down view of it. And you can watch the features basically grow in uh, in real time here in about four 
uh, seconds or so. This is what it looks like uh, to the user in the lab, uh, just blasting red light into the resin as we go. And the nice thing is we can move this around in X and Y uh, such that we can move here up to about 100 million uh, voxels per second, which means if we go back to that, um, those nanowire prints or those microneedle prints that we were talking about at the beginning, instead of 12 hours, we think using a technique like this, we can get that down to a few minutes. And that really opens up opportunities now to build these nanostructures over much larger areas, which then opens up new opportunities to use them in a whole bunch of new and exciting fields. Uh, I'll just dart through these very, very briefly, uh, looking at things like optics, uh, bio, and uh, building new surfaces. Okay, so that's the scalability, and we think that's really an exciting area that um, is really up and coming for these types of, of nanoscale materials. But what I wanna highlight with the rest of my time here is actually our ability to drive the sustainability of these materials. And this is a, a project that I've done in collaboration with Danielle Mai in the chemical engineering department, as well as Yanjia in the chemical, or in, in the department of chemistry. And the idea here is that we wanna find a way to be able to design these 3D printing resins in a way that they can be reusable. And preferably not just reusable once, but over and over again, so that we're not constantly sending them to the landfill, right? Sort of a traditional example here, uh, when you 3D print a part, you immediately trash the support structures that you build, uh, you use the part for whatever you're using it for, form or fit, and then that goes in the trash can too. Of course, what we would like to see instead is to find a way to take and immediately uh, regenerate those supports in some way that they can be used and then those used parts at the end of their life cycle be recommissioned and reused as well. Uh, and in this way, we can really close off this loop to the trash can, reduce those, pl those plastics that are out there and enable this to be a lot more circular into, uh, for our economy and for our society. Now, as I said at the start of this talk, I, we really like thinking about light. And so the approach that we wanted to take to see if we could approach this type of technology was to see if we could control this process with light. Namely, could we take the techniques we've already seen where you can print with light, go from a liquid to a solid uh, with light, and actually invert that in the same material such that you could then go from a solid to a liquid with a different wavelength of light. And using light as your engine opens up a lot of really tremendous opportunities because you can really specifically pick the conditions under which this occurs, right? So you can choose not only the wavelength but the power densities that could cause each of these processes to occur. Uh, and that gives you really fundamental tunability on the design of the resin. But of course, if you start thinking through the technical details, this becomes uh, very difficult very quickly. And so we built a team with a bunch of different expertise to do this, and we've been investigating this now uh, for the last couple of years on how we can go about doing this. And basically what we need to do is we need to break this down into three main pieces, each of which need to be independently addressed. First, a way to actually just have a resin that can print and erase. This type of recyclability is not inherent in most materials, so you have to find a special material that can cycle hopefully many times. Uh, next, we need to find a way to get that light deep within the material. This seems like a really subtle point, but it actually goes back to the first one I raised. If you have a block of plastic that you're trying to erase, but the light only gets absorbed at the surface, you've just made your part a little wet, right? And that's in inconvenient and, and kind of gross for everyone. Um, you need to get that light deeper in there. And then finally, we have to find a way to quantify that. So what our team settled on here uh, is a series of different systems. I won't talk too much about the chemistry other than to say basically we're building these long-armed networks that basically will bind together or release from each other depending on the wavelength of light that you show. So you can make a plastic or you can return it to the liquid state. And we're gonna use this same upconversion technology I already introduced to make sure we can get that light where it needs to be. And I wanna highlight these results. These come from, oh, Mike's face got cut off just a little bit. Sorry, Mike. Um, these come from Danielle's lab, uh, where they're basically mod they're monitoring the performance of these materials uh, as they go. And basically, we're plotting the, el the elastic and the viscous modulus here. And when these two curves cross over is when you've basically gelled your material. You've gone from a liquid to a solid. And then at the end here, you can see how, how stiff it gets at the end. But of course, the question is not, can we go from a liquid to a solid? It's, can we go back and forth between the two states? And brushing over a lot of really careful polymer science that I don't uh, have the time to talk about, basically, if we carefully engineer 
our uh, resin material, we can see that we can become better and better at going back. This is actually the back process here of going from solid to liquid. So you start uh, in the solid state and then you're able to go back to the liquid state here, see it revert, and then you can actually print it again. And so this opens up what we call a recycling window where basically you can excite this material back to the solution state by designing the particular arms of the system. And excitingly, and I wanna highlight great work from Eleanor who's here, um, we're able to now do this up to uh, three times before the resin really solidifies. You can see solid, liquid, solid, liquid, solid, liquid. And in fact, she's got a great effort to drive it to many more than three times as well as you sort of identify those mechanisms of uh, permanent solidification. So our vision here is, is straightforward. You can make a 3D part here. In, at the end of life, introduce the particular wavelength and intensity of light that you need to melt this get it back to the solution state, reprocess it, and close your economy. Finally, I'll highlight a couple other things happening in our lab that I didn't, want to didn't have the time to talk about today. We're really interested in this upconversion technique, not only for the sort of solution state applications I talked about here, like bio and 3D printing, but also looking at putting it in the thin film, which has opportunities in solar, uh, bioimaging, and night vision, as well as uh, engineering perovskite materials, both for light emission, as well as uh, photovoltaic effect, which is a lot of fun. With that, I'll thank the team here that did all of the work. Um, Danielle, Jan, and I at the PI level, Tracy, Brendan, Mike, Eleanor, and Chi, who did uh, the work at the student level. Uh, thanks to all of you and all the members of the lab, and I'll be happy to take questions in a while. Yeah, cool, thank you. So our next speaker is gonna be uh, Professor Simona Inouri. Uh, Simona is an associate professor in energy science engineering here at Stanford. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Joe, for the very insightful introduction. I'm very excited to be here, be able to participate and contribute to this panel on materials for circular economy. Um, the first talk by Dan was very captivating, very interesting. So it was really low energy type of talk. And uh, um, I'm going to take a, a step back here. And uh, um, I want to introduce you uh, to my lab. Uh, we're not really doing materials for circular economy, properly speaking. So our lab is uh, uh, focusing on uh, uh, solutions in terms of uh, algorithm development. Um, and so our algorithms are meant to be uh, scalable and cost-effective solutions to uh, increase the longevity and the performance of uh, systems in the sustainable transportation and uh, um, power grid uh, um, uh, systems. So uh, our work is at intersection of uh, modeling, control, uh, uh, dynamical systems optimization, and characterization. And uh, uh, we work with uh, uh, colleagues ac um, across campus uh, to uh, to use our technique and really, um, you know, uh, see them <clears throat> and demonstrate them on different uh, uh, in different fields. So um, I wanted to start with the definition of a circular economy. Uh, I believe that uh, in our mind, most in our mind, the circular economy is really about recycling in terms of uh, uh, when it pertains to uh, battery, lithium-ion battery systems. I wanted to take a step back and look at what the Environmental Protection Agency uh, defines as a circular economy. And this is a system that, uh, um, uh, it's a circular economy is a system-focused approach that involves industrial processes and economic activities that are regenerative by design and uh, enables resources used in such processes and activities to maintain their highest value for as long as possible by reducing waste. And I wanted to focus on a few keywords here. First of all, we're talking about a system-focused approach. This is an holistic framework that is meant to really look at the uh, entire life cycle of a, a product, of a system, of a process, and uh, with the purpose of uh, reactivate, regenerate, and reuse uh, uh, such systems, and uh, so avoiding the degradation and the um, uh, really the depletion of the system itself. And with the ultimate goal to maintain uh, in their highest value for as long as possible. So um, uh, improving and uh, make, making sure that those systems, once manufactured, uh, they last as long as possible is our goal in terms of uh, making sure the circular economy paradigm is uh, implemented. 
Um, I'm going to go back to the other definition a little bit. I want to go and look at uh, key trends in sustainable transportation. Uh, most of you already know all of that, and uh, it's clear the trend is, uh, is going up. We are living this, witnesses this uh, energy transition in the um, electrified transportation sector, and, uh, and things are just going uh, go up, and we will see more and more electric vehicles uh, on the road in the next uh, uh, in the next future. It's not only in California, we see those every day, but also in the US and uh, globally speaking. And uh, um, the share of those electric vehicles is gonna, uh, is gonna increase. What that means is that now we have a new problem that we didn't think of 13 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, when we started putting those EVs on the road. And that is the uh, battery uh, recycling, battery uh, disposal. And uh, so we want to make sure that when the vehicles get at the end of life, uh, we want to uh, make it also, uh, we want to make the end of life of the vehicle as green as uh, uh, its first uh, um, purpose and uh, operation was. So what do we do with those uh, uh, batteries? Well, that's a very critical question that we are all trying to address these days, and there are many stakeholders involved in this discussion. But let me just say that the current TV manufacturing uh, practices um, um, you know, in the battery space have been established uh, along the linear economy, um, economic model and not within the circular uh, economic model. And so there is really not a solution in the design phase about what we're going to do about, um, related to these battery packs. And uh, uh, conventional battery recycling techniques, as of today, they are still uh, um, energy intensive and emissions heavy. They're not environmentally friendly. Uh, water consumption and also emissions, the high temperature process in all of that makes them really not environmentally friendly. And uh, uh, lastly, a very important point here is that um, uh, those manufacturing practice, practices really fail to recover the embedded manufacturing value of those battery packs. Okay, so we made those uh, uh, packs, but then, you know, if we just send them to recycling after eight or uh, ten years, we're really losing a lot of that value. So we need to start looking at uh, uh, retired EV batteries, not as a waste management mm -hmm. problem, rather as a resource allocation problem. And if we look at this uh, uh, system from the eyes of a resource allocation problem, we see that we can be very creative. We can come up with very new solutions, innovative solutions to uh, make a good use of these uh, um, systems and align with the circular economy definitions. All the stakeholders that are aligned today, all the parties are uh, together. And uh, we also have the um, strong support uh, of the government. As of like two weeks ago, we, <clears throat> we, uh, we as a group, but also uh, with other uh, university research labs, we uh, responded to a DOE solicitation on, the, on uh, um, uh, um, battery recycling and uh, uh, second life applications. And, uh, and uh, there is an ongoing RPI solicitation now, uh, call for proposal for circular electric vehicle battery supply uh, chain. So uh, there is a big support, and I just wanted to say last year, Will Tarpey and I were sitting in a panel on circular economy, and the discussion at that time was either, oh, does it make sense even repurposing batteries, and it wasn't like when. It was like, no, really, there is no economic value in those systems, we should just recycle. But this year, one year after, we say that all, everything is on the table again, and things are shaping up in a different uh, way. Um, so the second life battery uh, um, market is expected to grow, and the predictions uh, see uh, um, um, the projected value of this market is around 10 billion in by 2030, and uh, it is also anticipated to be the uh, sector with the fastest growth in the next uh, uh, 10 years or so. There are a few benefits uh, of uh, reusing those batteries. Um, first of all, is uh, resource uh, conservation. You know, we don't have to mine new materials, metals to make batteries. We can use uh, the battery packs we already have. Of course, they are degraded. The performance is not the same as the packs, uh, um, uh, new, freshly uh, made pack, but there's still life there that should be uh, used. Cost savings, uh, those packs cost at least half of the price of uh, uh, new packs, and they can be reused, they can be employed in, uh, um, in uh, situations, in contexts that, uh, you know, uh, cost is, a, uh, is an important uh, uh, metrics. 
sustainability, the footprint, uh, the carbon footprint of these batteries can be, lithium ion batteries can be reduced once and if they are reused. And social impact, these are very important points that I want to uh, spend a few um, words about. First of all, access to energy. We are able to create opportunities and deploy energy systems to remote location to community that, you know, traditionally are off grid, they don't have access to electricity. Um, it creates job and new jobs, new economy, new market. Now those battery packs in some cases needs to be dismantled and needs to be, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> refurbished. So, and the uh, cells and module needs to be tested and, and also repackaging. So that creates a very new niche of, uh, um, of, of jobs that didn't exist before. And also resilience uh, and disaster readiness. So if there is some environmental, um, uh, um, uh, environmental problem, or, or like Katrina, for example, if you think about it, the ability to deploy these energy storage solutions in the form of second life uh, energy storage really will help uh, um, to, um, to recover from disaster um, easily and, and then quickly. So there are all sorts of uh, benefits that uh, uh, probably we, uh, we, we can all agree with. The second life battery market is uh, as diverse as the first life market. Where there are a whole bunch of applications here that uh, we can think of stationary energy storage um, to, um, to be paired with renewable, intermittent, and variable renewable resources, uh, charging station for electric vehicles, off-grid power system, um, transmission power, for example, or deployment to remote location without access to electricity, uh, grid stabilization, so frequency regulation, for example, and backup power systems. Uh, we can employ them in residential energy storage and be used for industrial commercial application, for um, uh, um, peak shaving, and also uh, we can use them. And they're being used in uh, two or three wheelers in uh, countries like uh, uh, India. I wanted to give you a few examples of how creative people have been uh, um, across the globe in reusing those batteries. Here you see, maybe you, you know this place, this is the uh, football uh, stadium in Amsterdam. In this, uh, so what they did was to put 150 battery packs from Nissan Leaf. And so these are uh, constituting the uh, energy storage from Second Life uh, for uh, possible um, power outages. Um, this uh, is the uh, 1.5 megawatt solar farm in California, built by uh, B2U. And uh, there are 6,000 battery uh, pack from Nissan Leaf. They've been uh, uh, basically uh, put in those containers. And what they do, they, uh, they are being charged from PV farm uh, that have been put across to it. They can be used in data center in France. There is a big startup there that use Second Life batteries, retired batteries, to support data center um, uh, energy needs. In Japan, um, Toyota is uh, working on, as actually a few years ago, they have uh, uh, launched this project where they are converting the 7-Eleven convenience stores into uh, basically energy station, and they're using uh, the used batteries to support the uh, sustainability of those uh, places. In New Zealand, they use a uh, uh, retired battery pack from uh, uh, buses to create charging stations for electric vehicles. And lastly, in India, um, we have a VW Volkswagen. They have teamed up with a um, local startup. And uh, what, they did, what they do, they reuse the uh, battery module from the e-tron to create battery uh, uh, portable batteries. And those portable batteries are being used by street vendors and as well as by, um, you know, in the context of electric sewing machine to make uh, uh, dresses, to sew dresses. So the social impact uh, uh, is really huge and is really pervasive in many different uh, um, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> domains. Uh, when it comes to look at repurposing, it shouldn't be a question of uh, either or in terms of recycling or repurposing, but it's a question of when. And so uh, I wanted to highlight here a process that we've been working on um, over the past two or three years where we uh, trying to understand how to streamline uh, um, a practice that uh, will allow us to receive battery pack, retire battery packs, and uh, look at 
their availability, whether or not they should be repurposed, reutilized, or they should be sent to recycling facility. Some packs are uh, damaged and they are you know, abused, and they've been used in locations where you know, the temperature was very high or things of that sort have been uh, particularly abused by the drivers. So they're not really good for repurposing because it will be a safety, there will be some safety issues there. So, so what we did was to, is to develop some battery sorting algorithm to understand whether or not those batteries are good enough for repurposing. And if they are not good for repurposing, they're gonna be sent directly to recycling. But if they're good for repurposing, then we have a new uh, challenge here, which is to be able to estimate in real time the state of health of those batteries once deployed uh, in the field. And eventually, you know, once they are depleted completely, they will be sent to uh, recycling. So uh, the first part is the resorting. Uh, we, um, we've been applying battery analytics techniques, some machine learning techniques to look at uh, uh, designing protocols to fast evaluating those those batteries, and the one it turns out is that uh, um, by just uh, um, applying a very constant current, constant voltage um, in charge, uh, profile in charge to those batteries, you're able to read uh, the degradation uh, of, this, uh, of these systems and create some machine learning model that allows you to, uh, to estimate their health. This is, this is a very fast, not invasive, and a quick uh, way to evaluate and uh, classify those, uh, those batteries. And so uh, upon downstream this, uh, this type of uh, work, we uh, eventually, when the batteries are good for um, repurposing, we develop BMS2. BMS2 is a new concept, this battery management system for second life. And uh, this is a purely data-driven uh, type of uh, uh, framework that we have developed to estimate the health of those batteries when used in a, a second life application. And there's a set of algorithms that run on the field in real time. Now, in order to really appreciate what BMS do, we need to probably be on the same page about what a battery management system is. And the battery management system is uh, this set of uh, algorithms and uh, uh, hardware, power electronics, that is created and uh, designed for a lithium-ion battery pack uh, to make them operate efficiently uh, over a long period of time and safely. So there are all sorts of tasks that we demand to the BMS to be achieved, like state of charge estimation, state of health estimation, battery protection, protection from overcharging, over discharging, and balancing and things of that sort. And historically and traditionally, this BMS is uh, designed using a bottom-up type of approach where we start from the lab and uh, we cycle and test the cells. We collect data, we create models, and then we assemble cells in pack, and then we deploy the BMS solution directly on the pack. Now, this type of approach cannot be used and uh, pursued for second life battery because when those batteries come to fac the facility, we don't know the history. And uh, uh, so we have to kind of have an approach where we don't have any base to, um, to really uh, create our state of health estimation. So everything has to uh, be uh, designed once uh, uh, we receive them. So uh, that's why we rely on a data-driven, pure data-driven approach. And uh, um, we developed our data-driven approach using uh, some um, uh, Nissan Leaf retired battery cells that uh, have been tested by our sponsor in uh, Santa Clara. Our sponsor is uh, Rely on Energy, a startup working on repurposing. And uh, um, they, they started looking at uh, gen generation one, generation two on these leaf batteries, uh, where the cells are the type of LMO uh, cathode and, uh, anode, um, and graphite in the, in the anode. So um, one of the characteristics of our aging campaign that we designed for them was to uh, mimic uh, uh, a typical grid uh, um, storage load profiles because we want to have uh, data that we, we're gonna be close, as close as possible to the real operation of the, of the system. 
Another characteristics that we implemented was to derate the battery uh, operation. So usually the uh, voltage operation is between 2.5 and 4.2 volts. Those are what, this is the range, voltage range that those batteries can withstand. In the case of second life, we uh, reduce that to three to four volts. So when you retire and uh, when you, you know, you need to be a little bit gentle and mindful about how you stress those batteries because they won't be as efficient as they're performing as they were in the first life. And the other uh, very important control parameters that we uh, look at is the temperature. So those batteries were not tested under temperature control condition, control temperature conditions, but they were kind of left in a um, room under, uh, you know, HVAC system. So falling typical uh, temperature range uh, within the um, within the environment, and. Uh, um, our aging campaign um, uh, consisted of, uh, you know, aging cycle and the periodic um, reference performance tests that were needed to evaluate objectively the uh, the system uh, the system health. And uh, one of the striking results we got is that if you look at capacity, uh, residual capacity of the second life batteries over a period of 15 months or so, we see that the capacity not only doesn't decrease, it actually increases, and the increasing capacity kind of follows the temperature uh, um, uh, envelope here. So after uh, these 15 months of operation, which correspond to uh, around uh, 100,000 ampere hour throughput, uh, those batteries had enough capacity left. And when we were looking at what, is the, what does this number mean, uh, basically, um, this number corresponds to an estimated equivalent grid service years between uh, 14 and 18 months, meaning that those batteries were used in a commercial energy storage system dispatch, residential energy storage dispatch will give you more than a decade of uh, um, operation. So our approach look at developing an offline uh, set of health estimation first uh, using machine learning models and using a pipeline that we developed to, you know, clean, filter, and uh, process the data. And uh, uh, we, we test different type of models and method, and we end up using the uh, elastic net regression model. And, uh, and that model was the base of our uh, BMS2. So once those batteries are being deployed in the field, what they do, they, they are equipped with this offline machine learning model, but then as new measurements come in, the new measure needs to be processed in a way that we have a, a guarantee of estimate of, of health. And so we, uh, we use a, a, an adaptive clustering-based classification approach. So new data will come in, we'll classify the feature from this new data, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll look at the closeness of this feature with respect to the offline features. So eventually, this is an uh, closed-loop system uh, that works in real time. And, uh, um, and what we could give uh, uh, as part of this work also guarantee of uh, boundedness. So we um, demonstrate analytically there is a bounded input, bounded output type of stability. So this way, what that, that tells you is that you have a guarantee that any estimate that comes out of this observer does not diverge. That's what that means. And, uh, and so right now, this uh, system, this solution is being used by our sponsor for the deploy deployment of uh, um, Second Life battery, uh, battery system. So I wanted to leave you with a uh, few takeaways here. First of all, reusing and repurposing and recycling are key to sustainability, uh, sustainable transportation, and also grid decarbonization. And uh, they really fit the circular economy uh, paradigm. And, uh, um, and we really need to um, think about a major shift in how we make those EV battery pack. So we need to think about today what is the best solution to implement and to engineer in a way that 10 years from now, the battery pack can be reused and repurposed for given specific applications. Right now, we don't do that. So we find ourselves in this uh, uh, you know, uh, problem and issues related to the dismantling of the pack and not knowing enough about the pack. And even from a BMS standpoint, uh, how can we design a BMS today uh, for fresh battery, automotive batteries, in a way that can be reused directly for repurposed batteries without the need to reinvent and implement the, uh, the algorithms um, again? 
And so we need uh, different types of design and materials and also uh, autonomous robotic system to evaluate the safety and the, uh, uh, and the uh, state of the health of those battery packs once they get to the uh, disassembly facility. Uh, one uh, drawback of today, uh, if, you, if you will, is that we have really small EV um, uh, numbers. We don't have as many EV packs as we wish we had. And even so, those, those EVs pack, uh, uh, battery packs do not uh, show sign of uh, premature aging. So they are very, um, they are very healthy, and so we don't know, we don't have the numbers we wish to have to really scale this type of uh, uh, technology. Yet those numbers will come soon because you know, as we saw, uh, there is an exponential increasing trend in the uh, deployment of EVs. So uh, with that, thank you so much. So some really interesting themes that Simona brought up. We'll, we'll pick this up in the uh, uh, question and answer session. The next speaker is uh, my colleague, Will Tarpe, from the Chemical Engineering Department uh, here at Stanford. Will, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. I'm going to um, go over. There will be some things I, I skip over just because I want to make sure we have time for uh, you all's questions. But I'll give you the highlights and happy to answer um, questions as much as er as you would like. Um, so I'm going to continue um, a related story that Simona mentioned in terms of battery circularity. And I'm going to focus on the recycling part, which, um, as she hinted at, is, is complementary. Right? These are, these are complementary techniques, recycling and repurposing, among others. Um, more broadly, um, uh, my group focuses on uh, wastewater is really broadly defined. So any, any water that someone wants to get rid of is a water that we're interested in taking from them. Um, uh, and we're particularly interested in wastewaters not just because they're fun, but because we believe they're uh, non-traditional feedstocks that are actually really promising. And as feedstocks like mines and other um, feedstocks we consider normal uh, today start to decrease in quality and quantity, wastewaters start to enter the picture. But um, today I'm going to focus on battery recycling with a focus on lithium as a critical material, but this can be applied to several other um, uh, critical materials relevant to the battery life cycle. Um, and we're going to focus on how we can uh, selectively uh, recover lithium from things like spent batteries, used batteries, and also uh, from brines. So this is work that's been uh, primarily done under the auspices of the Storage X initiative within uh, Precourt. So um, this I can highlight a little bit, um, but Simone has already touched on this. But in short, um, lithium, uh, supp li lithium supply will be outpaced by lithium demand on the order of this decade. Um, and so uh, what we think about are some alternative sources of uh, lithium that could meet this gap. Uh, so when we think about the lithium, and this is also lithium carbonate equivalents, but the lithium that we can get from traditional um, uh, brines and mines, uh, we're going to have this shortage around on the order of 2 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalents per year. Conveniently, if we look at oil field brines and uh, lithium ion battery waste predictions, uh, by 2030, we're on the right order, right? So these are feedstocks that start to enter the conversation and match the magnitude of the problem. So in um, this context, my group focuses, in chemical engineering language, we call ourselves a separations group. Um, that just means we focus on chemical processes where we care about purity. Um, but from a very abstract place, we can just think if you have two ions for us in solution and uh, we want to separate them, we want to demix them, right? Separate them into two high purity streams, one where one compound is the majority constituent in each one. So um, cases that you may be used to thinking about, things like reverse osmosis for a desalination plant, um, solvent-driven lithium extraction, and there's also adsorptive approaches as well for things like water softening, removing calcium and, and magnesium, for example, from water. So this um, image is one I really like from a National Academies report, but it was basically about sustainable separation. So very niche reading, I acknowledge, but um, I, I'm here to show you the one image that I think uh, you should uh, look at. And it's really about the energy associated with separations. So um, separations, in many ways, we talk about as sort of like a hidden uh, part of chemical manufacturing. Most of us, when we think about manufacturing, we think about running reactions, right? Uh, which, of course, is a really important part of manufacturing. But most of us buy products based on their purity, right? <laughs> Uh, when we, when we um, purchase a pharmaceutical, right, we want a high purity pharmaceutical. Um, and in fact, the majority of energy associated with chemical manufacturing is actually from separations, not from the reactions. Right? We can generate a product, but it's going to be in a mixture. It's not a really a valuable product until it's separated out at high purity. So in any case, the energy associated with these, most of the time we spend most of the scaled up processes are on this side, uh, phase change types of things, distillation, boiling water off, these types of things. That's how we do separations at scale. 
what we as a separations field are saying is we need to explore lower energy ways of achieving the same purities. So I'm going to focus on our work on membranes, which you can see all the way on the, on the right here, along with crystallization. So our work on battery recycling um, that we've been involved with as a group has taken a lot of forms. Um, so one of the things we focused on is uh, the environmental impacts of uh, these separations and of things like battery recycling. We focused a lot on developing new unit processes, so new separations techniques uh, that can be useful for these applications. And also focusing on zooming in within the process, can we make better materials that are more capable of doing really selective separations? Think lithium from sodium, they're really similar. Um, so in terms of how this work has, been, has taken place, a lot of it uh, from the environmental impact side has been through StorageX and all detail and interaction with Redwood materials that um, is on its way out in publication, but there's been a few um, news articles on recently. Um, ExxonMobil has been really behind a lot of our work on, on identifying and comparing different processes. As you can imagine, I, I explained membranes, I explained adsorbents, and I explained, I explained solvent extraction. Those are all really different ways of doing separations. A challenge is how do you compare those in an apples to apples way, right? Like how much of a membrane is similar to how much of an adsorbent bead is similar to what volume of a solvent, right? These are really challenging kind of system level uh, and process level problems. And then we've been designing um, new membranes because that's at a scientific level what we're uh, really excited about and we think there's a, a relevant place for an application as well. So in terms of, sorry, in terms of the work uh, with Redwood, so this is a, a, a paper that's under review right now, but Bloom, Bloomberg uh, News just covered it a couple weeks ago. Um, but in short, what we did is we looked at Redwood Materials' process for battery recycling. They're one of the largest battery recyclers uh, here in the US. But we wanted to compare conventional mining uh, to Redwood's processes, which you can see in the middle here, with some kind of representative, in quotes, uh, circular processes. These data are really hard to come by because our world keeps changing. People keep designing. Every week, I get an email about a new recycling plant and why haven't I included it in our analysis. <laughs> um, and it's like I got one yesterday. I'm like, awesome, I will. Um, but at some point, I have to be done. <laughs> with this study, um, but I think it's really exciting that a lot of this is going on. In any case, kind of in no surprise, we saw that, of course, recycling kind of intuitively aligns with your intuition. Recycling is lower CO2 equivalent emissions here than conventional mining. Um, but another thing that popped out at me here is you could look at things like, what if I recycle batteries versus scrap, like scrap on the floor, right? Um, I don't have to discharge it, so it actually costs me a lot less CO2. I emit less CO2 uh, per uh, NCA equivalent here. The other big part that popped out at me when we saw these data was this blue part is hydrometallurgical approaches. So this is when you're in water, what, how you do the separations, right? I didn't just call my own name here, but, um, but this is the part that, as a lab, we can really design. So this is how we got the context first to say, it is worth designing new selective membranes because the, the hydrometallurgical approach is actually where most of the energy uh, and uh, emissions are. So in terms of the process stuff, and I'll just show a couple slides on each of these things, I kind of mentioned this already, but there are lots of different ways to do these separations that we're interested in. And there are all these different factors you could use, and I, won't, I certainly won't show you uh, equations for today, um, but happy to if you want. Um, but in any case, there are lots of ways to compare this. But if, when we're talking about um, what people actually want to see in industry, right? we're talking about they want to do some separation tasks. Right? People come to me and say, I want to separate lithium from magnesium and calcium in a brine. Or they say, I want to separate lithium from nickel when I recycle my batteries. Right? Um, and they, then they want to say, show me the technologies that are available and how I would make an informed decision about which technology to do. And what I'm saying to you is that we don't yet have the data or the frameworks for me to actually answer that question in a, what I would consider a compelling, robust way. And so what we're trying to do is develop those frameworks so that we can compare different measures of selectivity from kind of um, niche academic communities that haven't had the occasion, really, to compare what they do to what others do. So you can imagine, and this is a, a kind of a cartoon graph, but one we're actually actively making now, we can start to have things like selectivity and productivity, kind of a measure of throughput, right? How much lithium can I generate, or how much of a separation can I do? And we can start to make these clouds of different categories of uh, approaches, and then really start to compare them on other bases as well. I'll walk you guys through a little bit of our work on, on membranes on the more molecular scale. But in short, um, most of the time when we think about um, membranes, we're talking about separating water from like all the salt that's in um, solution. Um, but what we're really after here are ways to separate ions from one another, which is a, a more is a harder challenge and is one that we really have to design at the molecular scale. So when we think about something like reverse osmosis, we're using size as the, as the way to discriminate between water and ions, for example. People have also used charge, right? Nafion membranes do this uh, very well. 
recently there are, are valency selective membranes. Kind of you can separate um, something like chloride from sulfate potentially um, by having different um, layers here or also based on size basically. Um, but what we're after is adding ion specific selectivity. So in short, adding chemistry to these membranes to really distinguish between lithium and sodium, for example. Again, really challenging, not something we're able to do yet, but we're starting to make progress. So one of my students, uh, Kristen, and this has been in collaboration with Yan Xia's group as well, but we're basically designing and trying to do this in a high throughput way, designing membranes that can be photopolymerized. We characterize them, we characterize their properties as well, and then we characterize their performance, which is what we're really interested in. How do we, in a diffusion setup or with electrochemical potential, compare the selectivity of lithium versus nickel, which is the example I'll show you, versus the partitioning versus the conductivity of those membranes. So I'll skip some of the details um, here, but in short, um, we have this uh, workflow where we can use a polyethylene glycol backbone, and we can introduce, just look, look at the highlights here, we can introduce different pendant groups, basically, right? And so we can just change out this pendant group and change the amount of it and try to screen for selectivity. Um, so we're interested, uh, being who we are, we're interested in some very fundamental design rules about if someone asked me to separate lithium from nickel, how would I go about designing that membrane in, in a, the most promising way? But along the way, we found a really promising uh, membrane. So um, this is a four vinyl pyridine uh, pendant group here. And what I'm showing you is lithium selectivity versus nickel. So this, again, is not the hardest separation we could do. Um, there are commercial membranes that could do this. Um, however, we're able to do the selectivity on the order of 1,000, right? So for every nickel that goes across, we can get 1,000 lithium ions to go across. Commercial membranes can do that, but they do it on the order of more like 30. Right, so we're getting like a 50x improvement, and we're able to really understand the um, sensitivity to the dose, if you will, the, the mole percentage of the membrane that we're interested in. We've also started to use electrochemical potential moving from material to process to say, what if I change the, the potential that I apply? Does that influence the selectivity I observe? And in fact, what we're seeing, at least initially, is that it does. So these are diffusion tests with no potential applied. This is electrodialysis, and we've added several other voltages here, driving forces for the transport. But in short, we can preserve uh, the permeability in yellow here, so the flux, more or less, of the ions. But we can increase the selectivity we see for lithium for over nickel just by applying electrochemical potential. And this is really exciting to us, because this tells us we can do this in electrodialysis and do it with a selective membrane. So we're combining membranes and processes. Awesome. So um, where we are right now is we're looking at kind of multiple effects here. We can change the ligand identity, the chemistry of the, of the membrane. We can change how much of the ligand there is. And really cool, we can change a process level per, uh, metric. We can change a driving force, even for the same membrane. We can change the performance. So I'll leave it there. Happy to answer questions and want to make sure I show the team. And this is ongoing work uh, here at Stanford. Right. That's it. Well. You guys can come up. <clears throat> so let me ask Dan and Simona to come up here, if you guys want to grab a seat. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, and uh, let me just sort of maybe just start off. So we heard from Dan about the opportunities for making things with light and design for recyclability. And you know, I think a beautiful example of maybe uh, skating to where the puck is going, talking about this intersection with um, micro and nanotechnologies and really driving that given what's happening in the economy. So beautiful talk there. Simona, uh, really getting in front of the electrical vehicle onslaught that we see and, and uh, maybe mitigating some of the mining needs when you can have a rich supply of concentrated reagents coming right out of vehicles. And, and uh, you know, the battery management system really maybe think of it as almost like a Patagonia-like approach where you know, trying to make the products last longer uh, as a as fundamental tenet for environmental <coughs> stewardship. Um, and then will throw people like me under the bus and talk about niche reading and separations, which I, I do myself too, and will, but uh, <laughs> not so niche, niche there. But, uh, but the focus on separations. Uh, and the key aspects of that. And, um, you know, and I think you could look at both Simona and Will's talks as you could, you know, that was fo heavily focused on EV, but you could do the same thing maybe in windmills and other big infrastructure things that are happening and the same sort of tenants associated with that. So uh, we're, we'll open up the questions here in a second, but maybe I'll start off. And many of you have answered the questions that we prepared for during your talk, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> but maybe ask, ask this, you know, if you were uh, king or queen for the day, uh, and you would think about 
you know, what would happen, what would you like to see happen from maybe a policy point of view, given you're all technical, that you think that would have a big impact in driving the mission forward? Dan. Yeah, that's a good ambush question. See, if you give us the questions ahead of time, I did, you can but prepare you, for them. Yeah, yeah but then you, you incorporated <laughs> my questions in your talk, so you ambushed me. <laughs> Fair enough. Double ambush. Yeah. Bit. No, I, I think that's a really, a really wonderful question. And I think, you know, there's been such amazing science happening across a broad range of fields um, that I think from a policy perspective, King from a day, the, the, the things that really drive uh, where I think we could really make substantial impact is just continuing to build connections and having mechanisms for which we can build connections from the research lab all the way through to the final product and making sure that this is sort of a holistic evaluation and that we're really answer, at, answering the questions that need to be answered, right? In terms of thinking about, you know, in the research lab, we think a lot, we've started increasingly thinking about the scalability and sustainability of a technique, not as something that you can staple on at the end, but something that you have to bake into a technology, right? And I can give you an easy example of this. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a, in the photovoltaic field, there's this new technology called perovskite materials, which are super exciting, but in the lab, we used a technique to make them that make cells that are this big. And it turns out that technique literally doesn't scale more than about this big. And if you want to do a grid scale solution, now you have to take that technology and find a new way to make it, right? You haven't baked that scalability and that sustainability in. In our lab, we found a solution to some of these challenges I'm talking about, but it used a molecule that had iridium in it. And it turns out if you solve a problem with iridium, you can get a nice paper, but you're never gonna scale it in any meaningful sense because of the cost of the material. And so I would say if I were king for a day, really finding way to build those bridges where these ideas of sustainability and scalability can really be baked in uh, from the start, like you're hearing from, from our colleagues here, is, is a really exciting opportunity to make sure that these impacts that happen in academic labs can really translate and make a meaningful difference for our, for our society. Great, yeah. great. Simona? Yeah, so um, you know, great science has been discussed today, Don, Will, and you. And, uh, and uh, for example, within the, the space of lithium ion batteries, uh, I think the engineering side of it has been kind of neglected over the past years. And uh, even with the um, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, if you read uh, um, you know, the, the, the blueprint and all of that, there is lots of uh, emphasis on, uh, on materials, on domestic mining, and all of that, on the science part of the batteries. But there's not much on the engineering side of it, which is as critical as the first part. And so if I were a queen uh, um, uh, today, I would queen, just... Queen or king, that's okay. good, yeah. Uh, I, I would really like to see more um, uh, the engineering side to be more evaluated, more, you know, valued, not evaluated, valued. So, so when you say that, what, click down for me, what, what are you distinguishing, distinguishing about? So, for example, uh, there isn't anything there that really stresses on uh, how we design pack. So the way we design PAC, and you know, now, uh, a couple of months ago, DOE came out with this call for proposal because they are evaluating, they are reassessing the way we manufacture in PAC. But two years ago, three years ago, when the uh, IRA came out, uh, there was no mention about anything like that. And uh, I think uh, things are changing a little bit. People are understanding that all the energy, effort, engineering we put into creating a PAC, for example, shouldn't get lost in 10 years, but we should be able to reuse it and uh, um, yeah, um, keep enjoying it for as long as possible. And uh, that's why I would like to see more emphasis on the engineering and the working together with scientists, of course. So we can retrofit, we can you know, reverse engineering uh, some process and ask ourselves what's the best way to make it in a way that lasts longer, in a way that we can reutilize it. And uh, um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> very insightful, you know, in the polymer industry that never happened 30, 40, 50 years ago, and look at the problem we're dealing with today. And so, you know, that's uh, getting in front of this would be really important. Will, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I would, um, I would, I would uh, focus on feedstocks, and I would, I would uh, incentivize people to use lower quality feedstocks and see how their process performs. Um, what what would happen if we we uh, and I might give them a bonus for what's popping in my mind is like you know like seventh generation dish soap or things like that like basically like you get a bonus for 
the dirtier your feed stock, or the more it's been, the more pipes it's been through, the more bonus you get because you've accomplished something that's more and more in the future. Because I just think our feed stocks are going to be decreasing in, in, in quality. And so if we can incentivize people to build materials, to design materials and design processes that can handle harder feed stocks, I think that's, that's often something I feel like I run into because it's like, well, all of this is based on predictions that our feed stocks are going to get worse and worse. And they come true. <laughs> but, the, but the different one, but someone's like, oh, but mine won't cut. Like, I'm not going to run out of this. Like, but it's like, we keep running out of other things. Um, why do you think we won't run out of your thing? Uh, so I think that incentivizing the, that like dirty feedstock type of, type of approach, I think, is, is going to be an interesting one. Well, that's really interesting. You think about <clears throat> the push for silicon and batteries. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people promulgating you know, highly engineered silicon. Yeah. Right, which is expensive mm -hmm. and high quality, but the more you get into commoditized versions of silicon, you know, mm -hmm. the better off, the, the cheaper these things will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your point is that intrinsically, as you get into recycling, it's going to get there anyway. Yeah. So why have these highly refined versions of silicon as an example? Mm -hmm. If you can start with some lower quality to begin with, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for Will. Uh, you mentioned solvent based approaches. It sounds like your lab is focused mostly on recovering resources from these waste streams rather than processing the water itself. Uh, I've heard of a few companies that have done solvent extraction, but where they're basically extracting the water from everything. Mm -hmm. Seems like a bazooka-based approach to this, but how does that compare to, uh, to trying to selectively filter out a bunch of different individual elements versus just removing the water out? Yeah, yeah, this is something that comes up a fair amount in lots of different verticals and, and ions we're interested in. Um, we have processes that can, like reverse osmosis is a great approach for that. And it's, it's um, I think the word bazooka is a, is a fine one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like water is definitely something you can recover from, from wastewater. But it's not always the most valuable thing to recover from, from wastewater, especially because we have processes already to get like clean drinking water, for example. We don't have processes to get clean lithium from, from brine. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a fine approach. It's a useful one. And I view most of what we do as like going into a process flow where there's a lithium selective process, then a nickel selective process, and eventually at the end, a water selective process. So I view all of these as like going together in the confusing network of pipes that's in my head. Yeah. <laughs> if you end up with just a bunch of salts at the end, mm -hmm. is it just harder to recover the it can be. It depends on the, the relative concentrations of them. But yeah, some in effect, in, in effect you're getting to like the bottoms. right? Of, and so then it's, it's a question of, like, is a mixed salt just as good as, as single salts? And actually, even in our Redwood paper, we saw that like a mixed nickel cobalt sulfate salt um, was just as valuable as a, as a nickel sulfate and a cobalt sulfate for this application. Yeah. And I think another thing that happens is that uh, a lot of times, maybe to append to my note about feedstocks, it's like, um, what is the lowest quality of material you could use as an input for your process? Like battery manufacturers, for obvious reasons, want to use as high purity as they can, right? But like, do we need it? There's a whole, I think, field of study that hasn't been done so far that's like, what's the lowest quality of feedstock I can use and still get a high purity product in terms of manufacturing? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Joe, Dan, Simona, Will, super fascinating. So I want to um, ask you all to expand a little bit on this concept, Will, first of all, of um, using lower quality feedstock. So from a compositional point of view, like how is, how is that defined first? And then how would you, what would you need to do to um, use those lower value feedstocks? And perhaps across different areas, so for the plastics and the batteries and other things. And then if we have time, or unless we want to go to another question, the design that you talked about, Simona, what, what does that look like to you? Is that, do you think about things in a modular basis or is there a certain size or like what, what's your thinking behind having some kind of thinking behind the design so that you can then reuse and repurpose things more easily? Will, you want to start? Sure, yeah, I think in terms of lower, lower quality, it could be like number of components, 
right? Uh, number of constituents, and it could also be relative concentrations, right? Maybe another one to add is availability. Like, um, like seawater is very available compared, well, more available <laughs> than, uh, than, than something like a high purity lithium stream, right? So, um, in, I mean, you, I guess you could also tie it to cost, right? And where there's negative costs, because some things you have to pay someone to get rid of, right? And some things are fine to find for now to discharge into the environment. But I think the more uh, the less likely someone is to pay you for that waste stream, though the, that to me would be a more complex and, and dirtier feedstock, lower quality feedstock. Yeah. And, and maybe a comment on that too, and I think cost is really a, mm -hmm. a key element in my mind. When you think about from a materials world, I think a fundamental tenet in business uh, would be commoditize your complement. Mm -hmm. you know, in the battery world, the complement are the materials. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about like, for example, Apple's complement, it's the apps for the phone. And they're trying to commoditize those. They want those to proliferate and the, app, the phones become more valuable. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that you can use more commodity versions of silicon or lithium and those sorts of things and driving down the cost will allow that to, to, to propagate as a business more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an interesting complement to talk about cost. Yeah. Dan, I don't know if you have thoughts on like mixed plastic waste <laughs> streams, for example. I don't know. Or mixed melts, maybe. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. On asking that question, I actually had a very different um, field come to mind, which, again, is, is one of photovoltaics, right? Okay. Which is thinking about the materials purity that you start when you're building yeah. a, a solar cell. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at different material systems, this actually um, varies wildly from some material systems where incredibly sensitive to any small errors in processing versus other material systems where they have some forgiveness for those types of, of materials. Uh, and in fact, when you talk about different material systems, one of the big advantages of, for example, a, a perovskite system is that it's relatively unaffected by, by small errors in the processing, by small <laughs> defects, and this opens up things like uh, cost opportunities because now you can manufacture your solar cell uh, at lower temperature and with, with less pure ingredients. If you look at the amount of just raw energy that goes into purifying crystalline silicon to the level that it needs to be to build a nice solar cell, it's a ton of energy that you're putting into there. Uh, and if you can find a way to manufacture uh, photovoltaics without that that may be more uh, resistant or, or where you can get away with lower quality processing, that's a huge, huge win uh, in almost exactly the same way. But it becomes a very material specific thing where you have to identify, you know, what is the material system I'm using? What is it very sensitive to? What is it relatively not sensitive to? And that type of investigation, which I think you touched on in your talk, is of crucial importance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Simona, it was a quick question about sure. design. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the problems we have today in the battery pack manufacturing area is that there is a high level of heterogeneity. So even the same OEMs, automotive companies, um, they manufacture their EVs uh, using packs with different uh, uh, cells, chemistry, cell format, and even pack configuration. So within the company, even if they want to go ahead and repurpose that pack, they have to deal with all sorts of different uh, um, nature of uh, the basic elements, which are cells. And so that, to me, is really uh, you know, something that can be improved. And uh, you know, the, the, the market and the, the economics is very dynamic. So those are things that sometimes you cannot really um, uh, plan ahead of time in a way that is uh, uh, um, efficient, but it's an area that can be improved uh, indeed. And also, even, you know, for example, the same automotive uh, companies has different type of vehicles. They can think of design a pack uh, that is modular in the sense that they just increase the size of the battery packs by adding additional modules. And each, mo each module, why not, can be self-controlled, self-monitor in a way that it has its own uh, local BMS in a way that you know, it can be uh, reused, repurposed later on. And I don't think that it's difficult things to do. And we're not mm, basically here proposing to add new sensors, new costs to the batteries. We are proposing to localize the monitoring, the, the brain. So it's algorithms, really. And those are really, uh, it should be easy to scale, those algorithms. Okay. So that's one thing that I. So there's a question in the back, and then we'll come up front here. Um, I have a quick question for Dan. So um, I work in photocatalysis, mm -hmm. and light penetration is probably the biggest challenge to reactive design here. Have you thought much about this? Are there any solutions that you propose? 
Yes. Um, so I, I can send you a couple papers offline where we've we've investigated this, where basically you can use uh, you can use these energy conversion, this upconversion technique, to really drive penetration depth and drive scalability, um, which works really nicely. The downside is that these processes tend to be uh, you know, kind of high to mid single digits percent efficient. So you're increasing your energy efficiency or, or you're decreasing your overall energy efficiency of your process. And so that, that trade-off is a really, uh, a really interesting one um, and one worth, worth thinking about. And especially I think you're seeing in this specific field that we're working in, those efficiencies are starting to creep up where now it's starting to get to more like, you know, 20 or 30 percent. And that's where it starts to be really uh, impactful for those types of applications to really drive that. Um, but there's, there's a couple of papers we did. Uh, we did one in uh, maybe four or five years ago in collaboration with Tom Rovis uh, at Columbia, which you could look up and, and uh, really shows using these uh, upconversion processes for uh, photochemical applications. We think it's a really exciting field. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing, I'm seeing, are really extraordinary that are happening here. I was really touched by the fact that you said maybe we could just stop uh, working on things and start implementing policy to actually move things forward. And I'm trying to think of what are the ways that, you know, you can be involved with working with uh, companies to do things that probably aren't in their best financial interest today, but do it through a policy-driven method where California requires 50% recycled content in plastic bottles. So you had to create a market. The, I was looking up, there was the lithium ion car battery recycling advisory group final report from the Cal EPA. It was a bill passed in 2018 and the group put out their recommendations in March 22, uh, but nothing's been done with that. Mm -hmm. So what ways could you work with the manufacturing groups and the business sector that you're doing every day to come up with these innovations to help drive some policy that might happen at the state level? Well, I hope I didn't misspeak. I didn't want to stop research. So, uh, <laughs> but I, what I, my point was you could grab some things that have been done yeah. and, and implement them now and start to move forward. And I, and I think there, we're lagging on some of those things. And, you know, and it's... Yeah, I think some of the things that I'm most optimistic on is I, you know, I think policies have slow. I, you know, the EPA disappointed me a long time ago on dry cleaning solvents. I thought they were going to ban perchloroethylene once there was an alternative. Never happened, mm -hmm. and that would have made a change. And um, and they didn't. And now perk's still with us. PFOS could have been eliminated in 1991, and it didn't. Uh, so. Not to be too, um, well, I won't go that direction. But you know, I, th I, think, I think companies, some companies can do things, uh, and I think consumer-facing companies often. So I'm, I'm bolstered, like Adidas, Adidas. They have a program for a closed, they call it the loop shoe, closed loop shoe. They believe in a polyurethane economy. They believe in an upper, the midsole, outsole, laces, all made out of polyurethanes and that they would then collect them at their stores. And so companies can implement more and more closed loop products driven by their mission as a company. Patagonia is kind of you know, like that. And so I'm a big believer in, in, in especially consumer facing companies to make some of those decisions on their own. I'd love to see policies, right? And, but you see Exxon, Exxon's building some of the largest polyethylene recycling, polyolefin recycling, and there's amazing new technologies. I was with uh, the organometallic chemist at uh, Northwestern this past week. Um, uh, Tobin, Mark. Mm. Yeah, and there's amazing new catalysts out there. In fact, one I wanted to tell you about. He's taking polyethylene, or uh, polyethylene terephthalate, PET, and making uh, purified, purified terephthalic acid and, and ethylene mm. from that. And there's other people taking polyolefins and recycling. So, there's new technologies out there that will allow these big companies to recycle and crack some of these polymers. And so, but I think companies and policy workers need to work together and some long range planning would be helpful, which seems crazy today. Um, and I think we're, we're at time. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us here um, and I encourage you to, to dig in. This is a really important field and it's for society, it's really important we make, continue to make uh, headway in this direction. So thank you all for participating. Thank our speakers. Thank you.